Hello, um, I'm back to um, talk about George Lucas <clears throat> and why he isn't a bad director or filmmaker in general. And um, um, because you know, there's so many people that say he's not very good or this or that. And um, one thing that prompted me to make this video. Though I thought about various things I could make uh, for today, and uh, I saw a video earlier this week that just made me decide this is what I'm going to do. And it was how, you know, Disney isn't, um, you know, isn't doing a good job with Star Wars. And, uh, <clears throat> but when doing that, they were uh, given digs at George Lucas. Now, he got lucky with Star Wars, you know. Episode 5 is the best and the most superior Star Wars ever, and this and that, and he didn't have anything to involve with that movie or Return of the Jedi. And he had too much control for the prequels, and that's why they're bad. Um, you know, I don't obviously agree with that. Uh, I've said in other videos I can link uh, one in particular uh, about Gary Kurtz in Lucas how um, he's kind of helped uh, give him some uh, fuel for the Lucas hate we've seen uh, since the prequel days, excuse me, it's just my hat. Um, and um, so, in many ways, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that kind of thing because I've already touched upon it already. Um, but you know, you know, I gave Kurtz credit that you know, not necessarily everything was his fault, at least in regards to things going over. limit or whatever, like over, um, over schedule, I should say, um, like with special effects, that kind of put, pushed some things back, but, and you know, I also want to give credit to George Lucas's wife at the time, you know, with editing, you know, she was very instrumental in that, um, I believe he acknowledges it as well, but people as I've seen say, like, you know, he just got lucky with that movie, and it was all her that saved it, and you know, there were two other editors, so I guess, uh, you know, they did nothing, I guess. <clears throat> At least in the way they, those people that say that, like, it, it was she that did that. Well, you know, she helped a good deal, but then she had to stop and do something else, like she was commissioned for like a, another pro, like she was already doing something, and then she had to get back to it, or she had to do something else that she was, she had a, she was committed to prior, um, and, uh, yeah, you know, George Lucas, though, himself did edit the film for a bit, uh, cause, you know, he was looking and there were some things he didn't get everything shot, so he had to, you know, and looking at it, like, things were bad, and he's like, uh, I'm going to have to recut this movie, because he fired the editor since the editor wasn't going to uh, edit it the way Lucas wanted it. So he was editing it for a while, but then he also had to uh, shoot some more stuff, <clears throat> and also see how ILM was doing. Um, and then that's where his wife and the other editors came in uh, to the picture. But, you know, with that, people say, like, George Lucas was lucky. Um, you know, he had, like, people around him. And um, I wrote a comment on another video I saw earlier today called George, Star Wars can't survive without George Lucas. 
they make points that I agree with, but then they make points I don't agree with entirely. Um, and I'm not going to go into all what they said, but one thing that they did say I didn't really agree with was they did say, like, you know, George Lucas had just Yes Men on Star Wars, on the prequels, on the Star Wars prequels. But the thing is, if you actually watch the documentaries and you watch the featurettes and listen to the commentaries and the, those three, you will actually hear how many people involved with like the editing or the special effects department or whatever, you'll hear people that didn't agree with George Lucas on everything he wanted to do. They even were able to either <clears throat> convince him to drop certain ideas altogether or to just, you know, just compromise, find a compromise to, okay, we can kind of do what you want, but you have to let us do what we want as well. We can actually find some middle ground and we can meet halfway for, so all of us are happy. Um, like, I want to say, like, uh, something I commented on was, um, how, notice that, um, that while that was all taking place, you can't argue that there could be some that should have perhaps put their foot down on certain aspects of the, of the filmmaking or other things that were going on with the making of the movie, like the effects. Like maybe not the shooting of the film, but uh, in the editing process. But it wasn't just a yes-men think tank, like so many people say. So many people say that, and it's so annoying. Because that's not the case, but people seem to have a certain view of George Lucas nowadays, and they don't want that view to ever change, even if things uh, are wrong, or maybe to an extent, there were some people that perhaps did just not necessarily agree with him, but I could Rick McCollum kind of, you could say he kind of went along with the ride. He didn't challenge George Lucas a whole lot. Um, but you can see in his face in some points, like, yeah, I don't know really know about this. And you can hear, see he and Lucas exchange some dialogue. Um, in the making of episode one in particular, um, you know, there's this famous or infamous, depending on your uh, perspective on it, was Jar Jar's the key to all this. We get Jar Jar working, because he's a funnier character than we've ever seen in these movies before. That kind of thing. Well, what they were doing beforehand was doing storyboards. And as the, you keep listening, you realize they're talking about the battle that the Gungans and the droids have on that boo. Because they just did like the storyboards, like filling in, like, this will be CGI. Well, this is real, and this is other stuff. This could be like a blend of both or something. And they're just discussing that part. What I believe what was being said was. Jar Jar was the key to that scene. You know, he's a funnier character, but I guess that because by that point we see this fight, this battle, we are to like Jar Jar uh, more. You know, hopefully. Hopefully the audience will like Jar Jar, so now when he's in charge of this fight as a general, you want him to succeed. Therefore, he is the key to this because he was looked at as the bumbling fool. Now he's, you know, he's like important now. He's important to this fight here. And another thing, 
connected to that was some people t uh, look at the uh, documentary and at the end when they're watching the movie and then they're talking about it afterwards like oh see George Lucas and everyone knew it was bad but they were too late they couldn't fix it you know, what that was was a cut of the film and they're talking about the editing of it he's talking to the editor more specifically and how if you go cut from like this from Jar after you know you have like the deaths of Qui-Gon and Morgan and you know you have Obi-Wan Morgan then you cut to Jar Jar doing something funny and you cut to Anakin blowing up the station you know, they're talking about the cutting in and how he's like, it may have gone too far in a few places, like how the editing and how it's laid out and how certain things need to be cut, trimmed, what needed to stay, and all that. But people don't look at it in the entire context of what it's supposed to be. Because again, uh, it's, it seems like the cool thing to do is to hate George Lucas. Or to hate on him, at least. Um, and this, again, now it's supposed to be about, this is about George Lucas being a good filmmaker. Well, with all that said, you know, George Lucas gets himself surrounded with the best people he believes are fit for each job. And he wants to ensure what he's making can be the best it can be. And I know THX 138 wasn't a huge success at the box office, but over time it's become a cult film, you know. It's, it's really good. Uh, and you look at the direction of that film and it's really good. The direction of American Graffiti is really good. Again, he got people together who he felt were the best suited for the job. And they all worked on them. They worked on the films. And, um, <clears throat> they worked on American Graffiti and they worked on Star Wars. George Lucas has talent. You can't say he doesn't because. Well, you can say he may not be the best director in the history of filmmaking. He is not a bad director. And I, again, I want to leave a, in the link in the video, or in the description, if, it's, if it hasn't already popped up beforehand. In the description, of, at least, will be a, a visual essay of why George Lucas is not a bad director. 17, almost 18 minutes long. It's a very good video. And, um, one thing I also want to say in regards of Star Wars is George Lucas is right. I've at times talked about it and even others said isn't the greatest of writing screen uh, like dialogue for, in his screenplays. You know, his best asset is telling the story, being the storyteller. And in terms of direction, you could say he's not the best at directing some actors, like Jake Lloyd or uh, Hayden Christensen. Those are two people who, people who played Anakin are the ones that you see often criticized for performing, for the performances. Jake Lloyd, I don't necessarily think was the greatest actor ever. This isn't a slight on him, but you know, he... But, you know, you can also say, are you, George Lucas never really learned how to, or never knew how to direct kids very well. Um, you know, sure, he, he's a nice guy and great guy. You know, so kids may <clears throat> uh, like him uh, because of the nice presence he gives out. Just enjoying. He seems like a good guy, you know. So, in a way, you could say 
while kids who audition for Star Wars, when they do see him and, and meet him, while they while he may like them and they may like him, when it comes to choosing a direction, you know, he could say he's not the best director in that regard. Um, though I've often thought it like he could be like, you could consider him to be somewhat like Steve Jobs, where <clears throat> Steve Jobs, you know, he was the idea man sort of like George Lucas is. While he doesn't really know a whole lot about the ins and outs of making a computer, he knows what he wants, he knows how to get it, he gets the right people. But then when something wouldn't go right, he would be upset, he would be angry, and yeah, he'd be frustrated, like, well, why can't you do this? It's supposed to be like that. I said it, I laid it out, just do it. But, you know, sometimes you can't just do it or do that. You could say similar things about George Lucas. Um, when hearing like Harrison Ford said, I wrote it, I wrote it on a page. You know, so just do that. As an actor, just do it. And sometimes you just can't do that. You know, you need some uh, direction that isn't just, just do that. Do it again, but faster. You know, faster, more intense. That's the thing he said as a director. Um, but, <clears throat> so in that way, you know, George Lucas is like, you know, directors. You know, he thinks actors, you know, they know how to act. So, just act. Read what I wrote. <clears throat> and then say it. Say it in a way that's convincing for everybody, and the lines wouldn't be very good. And this is getting into the writing part, you know. He wrote s space opera, which has melodramatic writing, which then requires melodramatic acting to complement it. And as a result of that, the characters aren't gonna sound and exactly act how you or I would speak or act in certain situations. You know, and as a result, yeah, it, it might seem odd, but from that aspect, it all makes sense. That's what makes Star Wars so unique and interesting. It's not your conventional, uh, average science fiction film. It's not your average fantasy film. It's a space opera. And some people don't seem to understand that. The melodramatic uh, elements of it. Um, you know, and with Jake Lloyd again. Because uh, I saw Jingle on the way, and he wasn't that great in that film. Honestly, and again, there's no slight slide to him or anything like that. I'm not trying to be mean, but he wasn't that great. But, you know, in The Phantom Menace, he, he acted like a kid. He acted like a kid that would be in a situation like that, and you'd be both excited and also, uh, he's just wondering. He's annoying. Kids can't be annoying. You know, there are kids who are not annoying, and there are kids who are. Anakin was a kid that was fairly annoying. Um, and with uh, Eden Christensen, uh, you know, the character of Anakin, by the time we see him, has been... He's had a harbor his feelings that um, are his normal feelings that he uh, was able to express like happiness, sadness, love, anger, etc. for 10 years because you know he was 9 in episode 1 and now he's 19 in episode 2. 
So he had to shut all that off. He could never have any more emotions. But when he meets Padme again, uh, the emotions of the, his crush that you know he wasn't necessarily able to get over, um, perhaps, that he probably should have, um, the, and the time he would have taken to you know, date and have relationships. And I know I've said all this stuff before, but again, this works with the filmmaking aspect of George Lucas and what he had Anakin doing. You know, with all of this, him being used to having emotions and expressing expressing them in a, a good portion of his life, and then for now most of his life not having or being able to feel those emotions, at some point that's going to come to a head. And it does in episode 2 when he meets Padme, and he's awkward. He's awkward, he's trying to impress her, says stuff like, I don't like Sam, and this and that. And a character, you know, as awkward and not as he is, when you see the development of him becoming Darth Vader, and then you see how his anger comes out when his mother dies, and then he's afraid of losing his wife in the third film. Anger and fear are something he's not supposed to have, because he's a Jedi, but he feels them. And as a result, that leads him down to the dark side. And this was the whole point of George Lucas in his filmmaking and storytelling of Star Wars was the Jedi, as great as these as these people were, great warriors and peacekeepers, they were so blind to realize that you know there's an evil here. You know, it's Palpatine. He's right there. And in a way, they have like this kind of ego kind of thing of the reputation as Jedis uh, being great warriors that they can't see uh, uh, this evil that's right in front of them. They can't see the dark sides come back. And as a result, and their rules of no emotion, no love, no this and that, when they do bring in somebody who is used to feeling emotion, who is so used to all of the normal things anybody would feel, that leads to them down to the dark side and is their downfall. And hence, in the original trilogy with Luke, Obi-Wan and Yoda are more accommodating to, like, okay, you can embrace these feelings, you can embrace love, you can embrace anger, you can embrace this and that. But it has to be in check, essentially. You have to keep them in place. And in the filmmaking aspect with the prequels, it works. It works, and there's, in the video, in the link about how George Lucas is not a bad director, really illustrates that. And um, it's a great film, or a great essay, video essay, and um, I think it's worth a watch. So, you know, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I know it kind of seemed a bit sporadic, and maybe seemed a bit to be a bit rambling, but. George Lucas is not a bad filmmaker. He didn't just get lucky because, you know, if he was just lucky, I don't think Star Wars would actually be as good as it is. It, it couldn't have been. I mean, uh, uh, making a film like Star Wars uh, is like, yeah, you know, I wrote this big huge thing then I was able to condense it down and take a part of it and make it into a script and now uh, like just one script 
a few hundred, like a hundred pages or so. And now, filmed and there's a lot of special effects. New stuff too, you know. Stuff we haven't seen really before. And, um, it's going to be more realistic, these effects, and it's going to go with the story, and it's going to, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be different. And, um, because he had to get, he got so lucky in getting all the right people, having everything aligned just right. He got lucky with the original Star Wars. But, uh, no, he didn't. Just get lucky. Uh, he, it's stuff like that. That's like uh, I doesn't make sense to me. So if you uh, enjoyed this video, perhaps watch that video essay about George Lucas. Maybe watch another uh, video I made up George Lucas or Star Wars in general. And, um, yeah. That's all I've got for today. And, uh, see you next time.